So uh, I want to share a message today uh, that I may have shared a long, long time ago. But I've been wanting to share this message because I want us to understand a little bit more about the prayer shawl. I want to understand more about the prayer shawl. And in fact, I want to encourage the men in this congregation to consider wearing a prayer shawl when you come to worship. Ah, oh, Noah likes that. I don't want to be the only one putting one on. Where's, there's a few of you who sometimes do. However, I don't want to coerce you to do it. And if you're not comfortable, don't do it. It's not going to change the world uh, if you do or don't. And, uh, but you're welcome to. Maybe a lot of you feel as if you shouldn't because you want to be respectful to the Jewish people. And uh, you don't want to pretend to be Jewish. And I understand that and I appreciate your, your sentiment. It's the same thing with the yarmulke. Why wear a yarmulke if you're not Jewish? Or why wear it at all? Well, uh, for me, it's a religious symbol, but it's also an identity symbol for me. And I do it at Ben Amashiach, not because I feel that I'm going to be specially blessed if I do it, but it's part of my identity and my connection with the Jewish people. And uh, the same with the prayer shawl. So some of you might think you don't want to wear it because you don't want to pretend to be Jewish, and that's good. You don't have to pretend to be Jewish, and by putting on a prayer shawl, you're not trying to say you're Jewish. If you go to any synagogue here in Melbourne, and remember there's around 45 around here, if you go to any synagogue on a Saturday morning, you only wear the talit on a, Saturday, on a morning services, should I say, generally. So if you go to any synagogue here, uh, they may ask you to wear a prayer shawl, or there may be prayer shawls there that you can put on, or they may just uh, not uh, uh, do anything with you, but you will have to wear a yarmulke, okay, to go into any synagogue. Uh, in Bad Mashiach, I want you to be free to wear or not to wear, okay? To put a kippah on or not to keep put a kippah on, to wear a talit, and I, and I guess I'm encouraging the men to do that uh, in my my kind of upbringing and paradigm, it's, uh, it's something that we do as men. Uh, so you can do it if you want to. Don't feel in any way obliged and don't feel that in any way you'll be looked down upon or, or in any way uh, it'll disadvantage you if you don't. So can you get my drift? You're welcome to, but you're not obliged to do it. I like the fact that we have the freedom to do it or not to do it at Ben HaMashiach, and I don't want that to change. But if you felt that it's something that you'd like to do, then what you need to do is do it respectfully. You need to understand what it is. You need to also understand how to wear it and how not to wear it in our context. So for instance, I'll give you an example. If, uh, when I leave the services here and drive home in my car, I don't wear my prayer shawl because it's a contradiction. You know, an Orthodox Jew wearing a prayer shawl driving his car home on a Shabbat doesn't work. <laughs> and in fact, I have a story that uh, I, our director of the work in, New, in Israel, I won't mention his name, but he did tell us a story that once he used to drive down to help run a congregation in uh, Tel Aviv every week. He was in Jerusalem. He drove down to Tel Aviv, helped around this con the congregation, and he'd wear a prayer shawl, and then he'll drive back wearing a prayer shawl as well, and he was pull over, pulled over by the police, who was quite sure that he was a terrorist, <laughs> because what Jew would drive on the Sabbath if you're an Orthodox Jew wearing a prayer shawl and sit sit? So he stopped doing it actually, because of that, and he stopped wearing it, because while you're out there wearing a prayer shawl, you're saying something, and also the tzitzit, you're saying something about Judaism, and uh, so don't leave here with your tzitzit and your prayer shawl on and get into a car on a bicycle and, and bicycle down the road. If you're going to wear one, you wear it here, then you take it off and you wrap it up nicely and put it away. And uh, same with your yarmulke, you take it off, and that's how I feel that uh, things should be done, should be culturally sensitive. Again, if you're wearing sit-sit, 
which is the basis of the prayer shawl. I'll go into the details of that in a moment. And then you go and sit down and have uh, something to eat at a local cafe, which many of us do, and I encourage that. Well, if your tzitzit is hanging out while you're doing it, again, it's a contradiction as an Orthodox Jew. Uh, and if you're wearing a tzitzit, you're making it look like you're an Orthodox Jew, but then you're going to go eat something in a local restaurant, and uh, that doesn't look right. So don't do it. You just don't do it. But if you're here in the building, you can wear your prayer shawl, and then when you go out, you take it off. All right, now if you have any further questions about that, uh, you can do that. I do not believe that Gentiles are obliged to wear a tzitzit. The commands in Scripture that we'll look at are commands for Israel, for the Jewish people. They are not commands for Gentiles. You're welcome to share in it and do it respectfully, but you're not required to do it. Okay, now that goes with all the law in actual fact. The law was given to Israel. And Gentiles are welcome to keep any of those laws if they want to, but you're not obliged to under covenant with God. Uh, you are welcome to join in with that. And of course, there are some laws that are definitely universal laws uh, that apply to all of us. Um, but we are under, as believers in the Messiah, we are under the law of Messiah, which incorporates many of the Tanakh laws, but not uh, all of them, for instance. So that's another, another subject for another time. However, you get my drift, is that we are welcome to join in together, but if we do it, we do it thoughtfully and respectfully. Okay, does that sound all right? All right, so let me teach a little bit about what this all means and why do we wear a prayer shawl. And uh, we're going to look at it through the eyes of a, uh, a, a story in the Brit Chadasha, in the Gospels themselves. There's a story of a woman who was very sick for 12 years with an, a flow of blood. She was walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee on one occasion when she, she saw, she saw, seashells. <laughs> she saw on the shore, she saw on the shore, Yeshua walking around with a whole lot of people around him. Big crowds of Jewish people following Yeshua around Galilee in those days. And we read of how she was so desperate that she pushed through the crowd to touch the hem of Yeshua's garment. And she was healed from that chronic sickness at that time. So we're going to look at the tzitzit from that perspective. So this is a well-known miracle story, but we often miss uh, what goes on between the lines and what the tzitzit represents. So let's read from Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 to 22. And suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind, that's behind Yeshua, and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Yeshua turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. What an incredible, and, uh, 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 incredible miracle. Can you imagine her desperation and her excitement about being healed at that time and we get a little bit more details when we read the gospel of mark when she heard about yeshua she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought if i just touch his clothes i'll be healed immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering at once yeshua realized that power had gone out from him he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Yeshua kept looking around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at, her, at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering." 
And so again, uh, an amazing story. But why did she go and touch his garment? And in particular, why did she reach out to touch the hem of Yeshua's garment? What is important about the hem of a Jewish man's garment? Well, the word translated hem is actually referring to the fringes. The fringes or the tassels, the tassels that are at the end of uh, a prayer shawl, or we'll look at what it looked like back then. Uh, the tassels are called tzitzit or tzitziyot in plural. Tzitzit or singular, tzitziyot, plural. And it was required to be attached to all uh, the corners, or well, the four corners of clothing of Israelite men, according to Numbers chapter 15, verse 37 in the Torah, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at so that you will remember the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by going after the lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So that in ancient Israel, men wore four-cornered outer tunics with tzitzit tied to the four corners. These outer garments later evolved over time, over the centuries, evolved into a formal prayer shawl like uh, you see Jewish men wearing today. But in those days, it was an outer garment and a tassel was uh, tied to the four corners. The tassels on the prayer shawl remind us to fulfill God's commandments, as we read in that scripture. So let's have a look at the meaning of these tassels and how they've developed in uh, Jewish faith. And, uh, of course, um, how they, they've been uh, understood uh, from within rabbinic Judaism, which goes back to the time of Yeshua. Each tassel uh, in the corner of the garment, each tassel is uh, threaded through a hole in the corner of the garment. It's looped through. There are, in fact, four strands that are looped through to make eight strands. Now, in the time of the Bible, one of the strands was the techelet. Techelet, that is the blue color. Now, I'll explain why this doesn't have a blue color in a minute. The eight strands are then tied in a series of five knots. There are five knots on the tassel the series of five knots. And in between each knot, the tassel is wound around a certain number of times, according to ancient Jewish tradition. So, when we look closely at the tassel, we look at the five knots. The five knots represents the Torah. Well, we have the PowerPoint there. And in this particular way of presenting the PowerPoint, you get the, whole, you get the whole PowerPoint all at once. So you got the answer there. Five represents the five books of Moses. Then in between the five knots, there are four windings. The four windings represent the ineffable holy name of God, which we only know really, yud Hey vav Hey. We don't know exactly how to pronounce that, Yahweh is perhaps the closest guess that we have today. We don't know exactly if that is correct. The actual pronunciation of that name was stopped being used 200 years before Yeshua because the priests didn't want people who didn't deserve it to be blessed by using the name. So, and of course in fulfillment of uh, command, do not use the Lord's name in vain. And that's why Jewish people stopped pronouncing it even 200 years before Yeshua. And guess what? We forgot how to pronounce it then because we didn't use it for so long. So you just see the yud Hey vav Hey. In the Bible, when it's yud Hey vav Hey, in the Hebrew, you have Adonai in the Hebrew. It's been replaced. Or when you read it, it's replaced. In the English, you know that by the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see that, 
the Lord is now not just Adonai, but actually it refers to the yud Hey vav Hey. But we stop pronouncing it as I said. And uh, that could be another sermon as well. But uh, that's what the four windings in between the four knots represent. So you have eight strands. You have five knots, which equals the number 13. The number 13 is the numerical value. So every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. And there's a study of this that goes on in Judaism. And uh, we don't get into it too, too much, but uh, we can see that it does make sense on many occasions. And the Hebrew word echad, the Hebrew word echad has a numerical value of 13. The word echad we use in our prayers. And in traditional Judaism, you would use it three times a day. Of course, here at Beit HaMashiach, we always start our services with the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Echad means unity. It doesn't mean singularity. It means unity. And I'm not going to get into that too much right now. But just to say that the, uh, f- the, five, the eight strands, the five knots, as uh, the number 13 represents the uniqueness of God, the unity of God, the oneness of God, that he is the, mo- he is the unique God of the universe. There is no other God in actual fact. All the other so-called gods are not gods. They're gods that people have made, but there is only one. And that's what the five uh, knots and the eight strands remind us of. So therefore the tzitzit also represents the 613 laws. There are 613 mitzvot in the scriptures, 613 of them. And uh, the 613 are made up of 365 prohibitions. You shall not do this and you shall not do that. And together with 248 affirmations, you must do this and you must do that. Altogether, the rabbis have counted it, believe me, 613 commandments. And do you know also, funny enough, the rabbis also so, say that one of the seven fruits of the land is the pomegranate. And the reason for it is that there are 613 seeds in the pomegranate. Now, I've never tried to count it. Even though I've got a pomegranate tree in the backyard, uh, so I'm not sure how true that is. But anyhow, 613. And so uh, we've had the number 13. And where the number 600 comes from is the numerical value of the word tzitzit. Numerical value of tzitzit is 600 plus 13 gives us 613. So you can start to see what the tassels are reminding us of. So let's summarize. The tassels remind us of the name and the identity of God. Reminds us of his ineffable name and his uniqueness. It reminds us of God's wisdom. The 613 laws are part of God's wisdom. The Torah is holy and good, the Apostle Paul tells us. There's nothing wrong with the Torah. The problem is there's something wrong with us. We can't keep it, therefore we fail, and we come under God's judgment. And so the fact is that the tassels represent uh, the 613 laws of God, representing the wisdom in the Torah, for me, The tassels just not only represent the five books of Moses, but all of God's word, all of God's word. Torah, prophets, and Nevi'im, sorry, Torah, prophets, and writings, and the Brit Chadashah, the New Covenant as well. I think of all of it when I think of the tassel. And it reminds us of the uniqueness and the unity of God. Uniqueness of God is the only one in the universe, and the unity of God. And from our Messianic Jewish perspective, and certainly something we hold on to very tightly here at Beit HaMashiach and our affiliated congregations is the triune aspect of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We believe that. We believe it's biblical. We believe it's Jewish, actually. And uh, we, we believe that it's represented also in the tassel. And we believe that, well, we can see that this tzitzit represents the fullness of God's word and will as it represented by the Torah. So, these tassels were hanging off the corners of Israelite men's garments. And they were to be a constant reminder to walk according to God's laws. The Hebrew word for law 
is not really the word for law. It's the word halakha. Halakha is the word to walk because the Torah gives us the way to walk. And so uh, the tassels remind us how to walk in the way of God. It's a little bit like those very, how do I say this, a very committed Christians who are bold enough to put a sticker on their car with a fish on it. How many of you have done that? How many of you do do that? Well, good on you. Do you do that there, Ant? You used to. Before you started to drive like you do. I've been in his car. It's like very fast. (laughs) So that's the point. If you put a sticker on your car saying Yeshua or Isus or whatever it says in the Greek, make sure you obey the road laws. Because if you don't, you've been a bad witness, especially when you cut somebody off and scream at them and shout them. (laughs) So rather don't you put a sticker on. Same thing with the tzitzit. Don't wear it if you're going to break God's commandments. And, uh, you know, as I said, in our context, use it very respectfully. So because Jewish people wear Western clothes today, you see down in Caulfield here and uh, drive down to Ripon Lee, they have lots of different outfits, very uh, elaborate outfits. Uh, and so they don't, on a Saturday, you'll see them walking around with a prayer shawl on, perhaps. But on other days, they, they wear a prayer shawl every day under their clothes called a ta- talit katan, a small prayer shawl. It's basically the same thing, and they've designed it even to be like a little T-shirt that you put underneath uh, with tassels. Or there's a square version of that with a hole in the, uh, for your head to go through. And the tassels then just come out of your clothes, right? And you've seen that all the time. And, uh, and people have, uh, wear that. Now, that's how they still continue to keep this command. Also, when in prayer, you often see Jewish men at the Western Wall or in the synagogue putting the talit over your head. And this is uh, for prayer. And it's like going in uh, to a prayer closet, as Yeshua referred to it as. Uh, but as you cut out the world from around you. And the prayer shawls, as you can see, are always uh, white. The base color is white. And um, then, of course, uh, the white represents purity, of course. And then you have the blue representing the heavens, the blue heavens, or the dwelling place of the Lord. And the color blue is very important uh, that we see on the prayer shawls. Some prayer shawls don't have the color blue. They're black and white. Uh, But... Originally, the blue color was very important. And of course, we see the same colors represented on the flag of Israel, the blue of the uh, prayer shawl. But why don't we have blue color in our prayer shawls today for the most part? You'll find that some prayer shawls do have a blue thread, but it's uh, not authorized by, uh, by the mainstream Judaism. There are certain groups of Judaism and orthodoxy that have authorized the blue, but primarily there's no blue because we don't know what shade of blue it is because the murex snail that was used to actually uh, to, to extract a dye from the gland of that snail, uh, that snail has disappeared. It's extinct. That particular sna- snail, snail is distinct. And you know that uh, the blue came from a small gland and it took 12,000 snails to fill up a thimble-sized amount of blue dye. 12,000 snails, quite a lot of work. And therefore, it was very expensive. In 200 BC, one pound of dyed blue uh, cloth was the equivalent of $36,000. And 8,300, the same pound of blue cloth, cost $96,000. So you all got blue. I love blue. It's my favorite color, perhaps, blue and black. Some of you got blue. It would have been terribly expensive to have blue in the time of the Bible. And this is actually also shorthand because you read something about Lydia in the book of Acts. Lydia in the book of Acts, she was a seller of purple cloth. So blue cloth, purple cloth. And that meant that she was a very wealthy woman and one was the first 
uh, uh, women to become believers uh, in, uh, in Europe. So uh, she did well. Um, and so a blue thread was something very divine. A blue thread was something very special. It's called techelet in the Hebrew. You read about the techelet. It was passed on. Father passed on the techelet to his, his uh, oldest son, etc., etc. Very precious. And uh, it's a treasured possession, a segula. Uh, and therefore, blue is also associated with royalty because really it was so expensive. All right, so what about authority? Why does this represent authority? Well, these tassels came to be associated with someone's authority, and this is very strongly in, uh, in illustrated by the story of the apostle. Let me go back. The story of, uh, of King David and Saul. The story of King David and Saul. King David uh, was, gonna, uh, was uh, anointed as the next king of Israel, but Saul was not happy about that, remember? Saul was jealous of David because he had been anointed, and Saul sought to hunt him down and to kill him. And so if you ever go to Ein Gedi in Israel, that's where David uh, actually uh, ran to in the desert next to the Dead Sea, beautiful spring in Ein Gedi, and he hid amongst uh, the, cl- the caves there. Now there was on one occasion that Saul was hunting him down, and uh, Saul came to Ein Gedi, where David was, looking for Saul, but he needed a wee. He needed to go to the toilet. And I love the Bible, how it actually gives us this information. <laughs> and so he had to put aside his, uh, uh, his um, pursuit of David, and he went into a cave, and he started to relieve himself in the cave. David crept up behind him in the cave and could have killed him, but instead he cut off the corner of his robe. He cut off the corner of the robe. It says in 1 Samuel, see my father. He, David actually says to Saul afterwards, calls out to him and said, hey, look, I cut the corner of, the, of your robe up. He says this, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand would not touch you. He got convicted by the Lord because he, he, uh, he started to, uh, to usurp Saul's authority. He understood that Saul was the king. And even though he cut off the corner of the robe, which meant he's cut off his authority, he felt bad about that. And he said, well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm sorry for doing that. And uh, I'm not going to uh, stand up against the Lord's anointed. And then, of course, in time, he did become king. Another example of the robe being a sign of authority is in that wonderful story that we tell at the feast of Shavuot, the story of Ruth and Boaz. So Ruth was a Moabite. She attaches herself to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who is Jewish. She leaves her family of the Moabites and her people, and she joins with uh, Ruth and the people of Israel, and she becomes uh, a a foreigner in Israel, but she is looking uh, for food, and she's gleaning from the fields, the edges of the fields, and uh, picking up wheat, And who notices her? Boaz. She must have been quite good looking, but she also had a great reputation of being a faithful woman. Boaz took notice of her. And so there's a a, a moment where uh, Ruth does something uh, quite, um, quite out there, quite provocative. It says in Ruth chapter three, verse eight to nine, in the middle of the night, Something startled the man. So Boaz is sleeping on the threshing floor of the harvest uh, in the harvest time. And in the middle of the night, something startles him and he turns and he discovers a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are my kinsman redeemer. She uh, was not making an appeal to him. Uh, simply uh, uh, for sexual relations. She's asking to come under his authority as her husband, that he would use this law, the kingsman redeemer, 
as he was the closest kinsman to her, that he had the right to take her in as a wife, and she was making an appeal based on that law in the Bible. And so she, he does. And isn't it amazing that she becomes the great-grandmother of King David? And, uh, of course, uh, in the lineage of the Messiah himself. But she came under his corner of the garment, his authority. Now let's go back to the woman on the shores of the Sea of Galilee who came to Yeshua for healing. She was desperate because all the cures that she had sought after had not worked. She had spent all the money on doctors. I know what that's like. Just the last three or four weeks, I've been going from one specialist to another specialist. The doctor sends you to get an x-ray. Come back to the doctor, pay him some more. He says, no, I need you to go now for an ultrasound. So then you go and, uh, and you pay the doctor again. Go to the ultrasound, pay the ultrasound. Go back to the doctor. He says, no, now you need an MRI. So you pay the doctor, then go back to the, the MRI, get the MRI, $500 later. Go back to the doctor, and he says, no, okay, I need to send you to a foot specialist. Thank you very much, doctor. He has some more money, and you go to the foot specialist. The foot specialist shuffles the papers and looks at the images and says, no, I need to send you to a surgeon. So you pay the specialist and off you go to the surgeon. Then you go to the surgeon and he does the same thing. He says, oh yes, okay, I need you to go get uh, another x-ray and a, and, a, and a biopsy and we'll send you off there. I don't think it's a problem. By the way, it's not a problem. I knew it wasn't a problem. He says, not a problem, but I think you probably need a biopsy. Here you go, okay, here's another 250 for the specialist and you go off and get a biopsy and pay another $200, whatever. It's terrible. I don't know what kind of system that is. It's just shocking. She probably had something similar from one doctor to another trying to, trying to get uh, a reason for her sickness. Dr. Yeshua would have been the best, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll grab hold of the corner of the road myself. Okay, but she was at the end of her rope. But you know what? She shouldn't have been in the public. She was breaking the law. She was breaking the Torah law because she had a flow of blood and she was unclean. So she wasn't meant to be in the public. And she wasn't meant to be touching anyone. Certainly not touching any man. By the way, just so you know, if you meet a rabbi, an orthodox rabbi, and you're a lady, don't try and shake his hand. Because it's an embarrassing moment that happens at that little point. It's a little bit uh, awkward, because he won't shake your hand. Not because you're uh, a Gentile, but because you're female, and you may be uh, in that time of the month. So uh, don't try that out. And so you, this woman, at the end of the rope, she, she had enough of everything, she pushed past the crowd, but she doesn't just kind of tackle Yeshua. She grabs hold of the corner of his, his garment. For this woman, the tassels represented God's word and his perfect will, which is always a place where you can find healing. The fringes also rep represented Yeshua's authority. He was a rabbi who taught with authority, the scriptures tell us. But also the fringes represented a special promise of God's healing. In the prophet Malachi, this the uh, prophet spoke of the Messiah, and the prophet Malachi said, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Now the word wings is kanafim, the, the kanaf, which is the fringe-like feathers at the end of the bird of prey. And also the tassels are called the same, the same Hebrew word. And so she thought to herself, If I can grab hold of his tassels, if I grab hold of his wings, like Malachi said, I will find healing. And that's what she did. She, she just reached out and touched Yeshua's tzitzit. And what happens? Power goes out of Yeshua and heals the woman. Now let me ask you, where is the power? Is the power in the tzitzit? Or is the power in Yeshua? The power is in Yeshua. And that's important. Because, you know, this is just a cloth. This is just material. There's no power in it. There's no power in any religious article, actually. And let that be something important for us to remember. The power is in God. 
And the healing is not because of the tzitzit, the healing is because of Yeshua's power. It went out from him. What was the tzitzit? It was just her connection to God's power. It was a symbol connecting her to God's power. There's no power in the tzitzit, and we're going to have the Lord's Supper in a minute, the Lord's Seder. There's no power in the matzah and the grape juice. There's no power in it. It's what they represent that is the power. It represents bodies, Yeshua's body and his blood given for us. So there's no power eating the matzah and the uh, grape juice. The power is in Yeshua, but they help us connect. They are symbols that connect us. So don't put your faith in the symbols. Put your faith in God himself. So important. Even when someone has a ministry of healing and prays for people to be healed, don't ever look to that person. The power is not in the person. The power is in God. Amen? And he says to her, daughter, your faith is healed. You go in peace. You're freed from your suffering. So we need to have enough faith like that woman to reach out and touch Yeshua's garments, to touch Yeshua's tzitzit. Whatever your need is, reach out to him and be like this woman whose, whose story is in the Bible now, all these years later. But you know, this woman was not the only one who was healed by reaching out to touch Yeshua's hem of his garment. We read... In Mark chapter 6, verse 56, And wherever he came, wherever Yeshua came, in villages, cities, or country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and, he besought, and besought him that he might, sorry, and besought him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. And so remember that Yeshua is the one who can bring healing, he can bring deliverance, he can bring healing in relationships, he can bring deliverance from illness, and we are all to be found under the wings of the Almighty. It says in Psalm 17 verse 8, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me under the shadow of your wings. And it also says in Psalm 61, I long to dwell in your tent forever, to take refuge in the shelter of your wings. That's where we should all be found. So, Perhaps this will give you a bit of an insight as to uh, why we wear a prayer shawl. But remembering the power is in God. And uh, remember the lessons I taught about how to do it respectfully. Amen.